Um, so where did you get the bones from? Let's take a look. Here at the Bone Museum, we believe in transparency, so let's take you through the entire process of acquiring a skeleton. These pieces are not coming from the ground, but are actually coming from average people that find themselves inheriting these pieces. So on our submission page on our website, we had an individual reach out to us from Ohio that had an authentic Oddfellow skeleton. Now this specifically is an Oddfellow skeleton. These were used by the Oddfellow Society as a hazing ritual for new initiates. Now just to clarify, these are still medical skeletons, but they were used by secret societies. The individual didn't know what to do with the skeleton and wanted us to have it here at the museum, so we negotiated a price and made a deal. A couple weeks later, this turned up at our door. After the piece arrives to our museum, we accession the skeleton into our permanent collection, and then we collect the seller's name, information, address, in case there's any issues with the piece. So let's take a look. So this is how the skeleton arrives to ensure that nothing gets damaged during transit. Here's an update on the skeleton. And here's the complete full medical skeleton. Now you might be noticing it's darker than some of the other medical skeletons in the museum, and this is because the previous owner had applied a lacquer to it. My life would be so much more peaceful if I kept all of these pieces hidden. Who would know I had it? But that is not my mission. My mission has always been open accessibility, and I have stood by this for over six years. I'm really glad that the medical bone trade is finally getting some spotlight because these pieces have been around for over a hundred years, but before we made it videos, no one seemed to care. Here at the Bone Museum, we're not afraid to have hard conversations. We really wanted to make this video to show our level of transparency and accountability. Here at the Bone Museum, we abide by NAGPRA. We don't work with the ossuary or tribal remains. We only work with medical skeletons. And we have forensic anthropologists around staff that verify that these bones are not from the previously mentioned categories. We know the skeleton is medical based on how it was prepared and the latches and hardware used. Once the medical skeleton has been fully accessioned into our archive, we give it an itemized number that is one of one. That way we can always track who sold the piece to us, which piece it is, and when did it enter our collection. This skeleton is from a time period in which the person legally had to donate their body to medical science in order to be skeletonized. In the event that the skeleton was acquired by unethical means, it was already illegal to begin with. We really need to understand the situations that these families find themselves in. Oftentimes they purchase a new home or just had a relative that passed away and next thing they know they have a full medical skeleton or a human skull that they just don't know what to do with. There was an academic journal posted that speculates that 2.4 million bones alone in India were sourced just to meet this medical demand. But the medical bone trade was a globalized trade and we can't oversimplify it to just India. Adam Ruley was based in the UK. Samsa was based in Europe and a lot of the bones are European of origin. Clay Adams was based in New York City and a lot of the bones from them are Caucasian of origin. When we had a forensic anthropologist verify our collection in 2022, 70% of our collection was verified to be European of origin. Because of how these pieces have been chemically cleaned, there's no DNA evidence left in the bones, so they can't be DNA tested. The majority of medical museums in the US are not equipped to handle this many human remains, so they can't be donated, and improper disposal of human remains is illegal, so you can't just dispose of these remains. Now, the majority of funerary homes and cemeteries will not do a burial without a death certificate, which these remains lack. There's no federal program right now set in place to deal with these remains. So in summary, nobody knows what to do with these bones. Our goal at the Bone Museum is to raise awareness about the medical bone trade, the injustices surrounding it, and letting you make your own informed decisions on how you feel about it. I have a colleague that has a skeleton from around this time period, and they have surviving provenance that came with it. Let me show you what it looks like. As you can imagine, not many of these surviving records make it with the skeleton. So to clarify, it wasn't that there are no letters of provenance with these bones, it's just oftentimes the individuals that purchased them in their time in the medical field didn't keep it. For example, do you have the manual for your fridge? No, and times that by 100 years, and it's what we're dealing with with these skeletal remains. So when people ask where are the letters of provenance, we have them, they're just in our office, we can't show you it for every single remain, but we do our best through multiple videos to show you how we source and acquire these pieces. And we have a policy that if you email us and ask us for letters of provenance, we show it to you. Funny enough, no one ever emails us. Everyone always says they do, but no one ever does. DMs also work on Instagram, but no one ever asks. We get 48,000 comments a month on both of our channels. We unfortunately cannot respond to every single one, but if you reach out to us personally, we're happy to give you more information. The skeletons here at the Bow Museum are not for sale. 
So in order to pay all of these forensic anthropologists that we partner with and to restore these pieces and keep them housed safely, we survive off a general admission and gift shop sales of merchandising. The Bone Museum's collection was started by John's Bones. The original goal was to figure out what do we do with all of these human remains that exist. Now John's Bones would purchase these pieces from individuals that didn't know what to do with these bones. We would curate them and sell them back to schools and universities to educate the next future generation of doctors and anthropologists. But our number one goal throughout all of this was to make osteology more accessible. We wanted to put our money where our mouth is, and this is why October 30th of last year, we opened the Bone Museum. Now the Bone Museum is a separate entity than John's Bones, and I wanted to make that distinction. And it is operated off of a different business model, which is general admission. In terms of profiteering, we are a business. Our goal is to curate these bones and make osteology more accessible to everybody. Funerary homes similarly make profit off of the dead and is a necessary and functioning business in our society. This is a necessary part of medical education. Anatomical variation is why we cannot study plastic skeletons. The human body is incredibly unique and you can look at the skull of two identical twins and there are more differences than similarities. This is why we have to work with real remains. Also, these remains exist anyways, so why not use them to educate future doctors and educators? According to this academic study, since the implementation of plastic teaching casts, there have been a 50% increase in medical students having to retake their entrance exams into medical school and a seven times increase in malpractice lawsuit due to inadequate anatomical understanding. Outside of being open to the general public, the museum is also open to schools, college visits, and researchers. I believe that everyone has the right to study the skeletal system and it shouldn't be reserved for individuals that are wealthy enough to afford advanced degrees. Now every single skeleton has a different story and we have over 300 individual remains in this museum. But I also wanted to point out that legally it had to have been donated. So as much as we can assume that it was unethically sourced, we also have to assume that some people wanted to be donated to science and some people wanted their skeletons to be displayed. Since at times we have no way of telling, our goal at the Bow Museum is to honor all of these pieces as they wanted to be donated and used for medical education. We have never supported the medical bone trade nor advocated for it. Our goal at the museum is to explain what the history is for you in the most unbiased and neutral way possible and let you make your own informed decisions on how you feel about it. Anytime money and profit gets involved in any industry, we of course see injustices. People always cite the Indian bone trade, but in reality, they tried to ban the bone trade three times and there was so much backlash from the general public that they reinstated it. And it wasn't until 1985 they successfully banned the trade. Let's look at India specifically. At one point, $2 million was being added to India's GDP each year due to the bone trade. Now, a lot of the medical skeletons produced in India stayed in India, and now India has one of the best medical education programs that exists in the world. Online, we make short form, one minute to one minute and 30 second videos. In the bone trade, there are historic issues, socio-political issues, financial issues, moral issues, and ethical issues. We can't always discuss it in a one minute bit. We make introductory content that get people interested on the field of osteology, and we hope that through our blogs and interviews that we do, as well as long form content on our YouTube channel, you guys can learn more there. The entire museum covers the history of this trade, and we reserve the more delicate conversations for in person, where we can truly have a dialogue and listen to what you have to say. There is no Wikipedia page on the medical bone trade. There are very little articles writing and talking about the trade outside of focusing on the Indian bone trade. There was so much more to the medical bone trade than just that. We primarily at the Bone Museum are doing research to try to figure out what were all the companies involved. Where did the bones go? Where were the bones sourced from? And honestly, people don't know. That's what we're trying to figure out here at the museum. And I wanted to highlight that the bone trade is still going on today, but in a different form. Just Google body brokers. People that are in end of life care, hospice, are still being approached by private medical companies to sell their remains after they pass away. This is still happening today. I'm sure we all heard stories of individuals that have been blown up due to military testing when they thought that they donated their body to medical science. 
and legally, if you read the fine paperwork, they did consent to it. Now, people get upset about the medical bone trade, but predatory practices are still happening today. Now, these predatory practices give a bad name to true medical donation that goes to advanced medical science. Similar to these remains, when we get comments of people saying they don't want to donate their bodies to medical science, this was a different program that existed over 40 years ago and is not what happens today. And these practices cast a negative light on those that are doing it correctly. Pivoting back to medical skeletons, Carol at the Mütter Museum willingly donated her body to medical science in order to be skeletonized and displayed to the public. So who are we to say what is right and what is wrong? At the end of the day, what's more dignified? Being left in an evidence locker until the end of time because people can't figure out what to do with these bones or to be put on display so future generations, educators, kids, and doctors can learn more. I wanted to reiterate this. Nobody wants to deal with these bones. People like to write journals about how much the trade sucked. People like to talk about it online, but who is actually dealing with these bones? Just so you know, I started John's Bones in my college dorm room at 18 years old because I wanted to find a solution of what to do with these bones. There have been bumps and hurdles and trials and tribulations I've had to go through, but we finally saved up enough to open the museum, which was always the goal. The one big precedent here at the Bone Museum is that these identities are anonymous. All of the individuals are anonymous and we cannot figure out who they are. There was an academic study done by the New York Times that bought a skull and took it to three of the top DNA labs in the city and all three labs came back inconclusive for DNA. We cannot figure out who these people are and anthropologists are currently arguing about it today. If you don't agree with the bone museum or the bone trade, that's absolutely fine. All I encourage you to do is do something about it. Raise money to help repatriate these remains. Become a forensic anthropologist and try to figure out who these people were. We understand that human remains are extremely sensitive, and sometimes when people see that they are displayed or available online, that can lead to a very visceral reaction. But whether we like it or not, unfortunately, we live in a world where these pieces exist. Now, unfortunately, the medical bone trade is such an undocumented part of human history. So when people spread misinformation about this industry or about the museum, and it goes to large groups of people that don't know any better, it causes so much harm. For example, at the museum, no one is allowed to touch bones. I think we saw a comment of saying that we let everyone touch the bones, and that's not true. In fact, you get asked to leave if you are caught touching the bones. So back in the day when we made content, we used museum quality replicas. Fast forward four years later, and sometimes people mistake those for real bones and get upset. So no, I've never played the drums with a real human skull. Or played air guitar with a child's spine. I know that probably upsets some people to hear. Now, if you have any more questions, talk to us. Send us an email. Let us know in a more direct fashion. We have so many new followers, we just noticed a large wave of misinformation and uninformed comments that we were getting in our channel. So we wanted to make a long form video talking about all the different topics that we can think of. We have a cumulative 800 million views across social media and 25 million likes. We had a documentary on Vice. We were on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. We had a documentary on the BBC and 73 unique articles and publications. If we wanted to hide our information, we would. I wouldn't be doing public interviews advocating for more information around this field. We recently gained 600,000 new followers across social media, and we had a lot of new people joining and were asking questions about sourcing and acquisition. So we wanted to make this video today showing you the thorough process of how we get skeletons, acquire them, settle them, accession them in the museum. So if you enjoyed this video, make sure to follow for more.